All right, so my first tattoo, I got my first tattoo. The plan was if I got an A on my report card, I can get my first tattoo. It was supposed to happen when I was 15. I got a B plus or something like that. Can't get a tattoo. That was next year. After I got the first one, I kind of went hand with the tattoos, but I had a list. Now, my plan was if you have a tattoo idea for longer than a year, then that's a good tattoo, tattoo for you to get because you actually meant that, you know? Um, I had about a 10, pay, a 10 tattoo list, and I got all those, knocked those all out. They all mean something, but um, I would have to say at one point that, like, I got a tattoo at least every two months. Then I started tattooing, and my homie and I was tattooing, tat for tat. Burchell Egerton, uh, CEO and designer of Made in Africa, bridging the gap between Brooklyn and Africa. Hood formal, I think it was. Right, right. I didn't start taking uh, Fashion Nine seriously until like the end of high school. Um, I was supposed to play basketball in college. That didn't work out so well. Uh, my knee, my knee had other plans. So that's when fashion design became it for real, because that was like the, that was that was the plan B. At that time, Farnsworth Bentley, Andre 3000, um, and I, I picked up I picked up a Vogue magazine and, and caught an interesting interest at, as far as that age goes to Oscar De La Renta. It was an interesting mix as far as aesthetic that I picked up. Um, might have looked like somebody's grandpa, but you know, it was the style aesthetic that I had at that time. Growing up, I was, I've been a Knicks fan, as stupid as that sounds. Um, yeah, just like sports has a, a big influence around like my peers in general. So it was like, how could I not be influenced by sports? Uh, like a lot of the designs that I have, they normally sell out real quick because I only make a few of them. But you always see like basketball jerseys and when the winter time comes up, hockey jerseys or uh, like there's always going to be some type of influence, whether it's the cut, the, the color blocking of like that team tribe type of feel. So I, I really like that tribe team feel, so that's what I always go for. Uh, Made in Africa. Uh, that name came about my first time in Africa. I went to Dakar, Senegal. Now, I've been designing for about seven years now. I never really had a name that anybody really felt. I've had a lot of names that didn't really work out well, like Blark Kent. Instead of CL, it was a DL. And I figured that any any fashion brand that really made it anywhere because the majority of people couldn't pronounce their name. So it was all about trying to find a name that people could not pronounce, but it would make them think about. So Blarit Kent was one, and people were like, what is that? That's stupid. I don't think you should roll with that. That one with Burchell, Burchell Egerton, it was like, da, 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 da. And so seven years went by, and then I finally came with Made in Africa in Senegal, and it stuck. So it's like, that's it. So I really feel like I just kind of started designing. Like, that is the homeland. Like, I under as soon as I landed, I felt why it's called the homeland. Like, I immediately felt home, but I've never been there before. Uh, going into different family factories, seeing all the fabrics, um, just seeing the different lifestyle that they have out there. Going to see the Red Door um, on Gory Island. Uh, you know, just different experiences out there in Senegal just hit me a certain way that kind of inspired me to to make this brand called Made in Africa, and I wouldn't have gotten that if I hadn't not made it to the motherland. And that's anywhere in Africa, I'm sure. I could have went to, to Ghana, Ivory Coast, or um, you know, anywhere and got that, not the same experience, but I would have got that vitamin, that, vi that necessary vitamin needed to, you know, inspire. But on the way back from Gory Island, I heard his voice. My that voice sounds so familiar. And I turn around and it's Fab Five Freddy. And he's, he actually, we actually sat down and have a, had a convo about the whole experience in Africa. And it was like, that was the best part of being in Africa, sitting down and talking with Fab Five Freddy. So, you know, I think the reason that is going so well for me now is because at this time, uh, the black community, it's kind of, it's kind of mandatory for us to be conscious at this time because there's so much foolery going on where, um, you know, killing of black teens in the streets by cops or um, killing by black teens by other black teens. And it's finally becoming like 
it's finally really brought to light. The media's finally putting the light on it. We're trying, we're finally opening up and seeing that this is not the way to be, killing each other. And it's like, we're now getting that unity vibe, that tribe vibe, and that's why people are so easily, like, they're, they're they see African. They kind of, they see, they, they, they appreciate it more. If I were to do this like a few years back, it probably would not be as accepted as it is now, I think. No matter if I'm by myself, or it's, it's a horrible day, like I'm gonna find a joke somewhere. Um, especially, and that comes from being in boarding school or just feeling like I was an outcast a lot of times, like you have to make yourself laugh. You can go through the shittiest of days, like you have to make yourself laugh. If you don't make yourself laugh, then <laughs> what you doing? You ain't gonna make it through the day. So that's that. Yeah, I don't know where I put my crown at, but. That would have to be the one article of clothing. Butt-ass nigga walking down a block with a crown on. That'll be it. <laughs> as long as I got my crown on, I'm dressed, you feel me? <laughs> yeah, nigga look dressed to me. <laughs> I actually feel naked right now. I don't got no crown. 